lot of reasons, 2021 was a year that many of us are happy to leave behind us. Community division and fear, an ongoing global pandemic, and record-setting gun violence. I'm Bill Anderson, and remember that just because 2021 is over doesn't make it inevitable that 2022 without action will be any better. So join us for the next 30 minutes as we feature people who are focused in 2022 on saving our streets. Turn on any channel on any day in 2021, and you were likely to hear staggering numbers of people shot and killed on our streets. As of December 13th, 529 homicides have been reported in Philadelphia. That's a record number of murders. But as we launched our Save Our Streets initiative, we slowly uncovered so many issues that go much deeper than just daily reporting. They won't care at all. It's not their family member or anything. They people don't care. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. I'm scared. Most focus, of course, on the lives lost and the people pulling the trigger. But what about where the guns come from? What we know from comprehensive tracing through the ATF National Tracing Center is that firearms uh, are primarily being diverted into Philadelphia from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. What about providing young people options? I know you come from the same streets I come from, or not even that, if you have uh, understanding of what I'm going through. That's it, honestly. Then I'll talk to you, and then I'll take from you. That makes sense? But you can't just get people that just graduated from Penn State College and be like, all right, now go talk to those gangsters with all the face tags and tell them to stop using guns. You can't do it because it's not going to work. And what about real policy changes to make a difference? We have the ability to use DNA in different ways. And so we're going to be expanding our capacity. So as we enter a new and hopefully better year, we're starting off looking at people proving that no matter how discouraging, things can get better. I was shot nine times. I know what it's like. I've been in a game all my life. I changed my life. People are doing their part to get us there. I think what we need more of is we need people to start encouraging the community to get more involved so that they can make sure the people they elect get more involved and address this problem. And people are encouraging us to look in the mirror at how all of us can be better. You know, we created the center to explore the idea that changing the way that journalists and news organizations report on violence might actually prevent community gun violence, prevent shootings, and save lives. So that in 2022, we can focus on Save Our Streets New Beginnings. One person can make a difference. That's not only the theme of our Save Our Streets initiative, but it's also the motivation for people like Jamal Johnson. He's angry, he's frustrated, but most of all, he's motivated to take those feelings and get to work. This is ridiculous. The lawlessness in this city is ridiculous. And for people to sit around here and act like they don't see it, it's ridiculous and I, I'm just sick of it. Jamal Johnson says that he's just one concerned man doing what he can to draw attention to the overwhelming gun violence in our communities. Maybe he is just one man, but he likely speaks for thousands. I think we're not getting the fact that this is a very serious, urgent situation. I mean, we got 31 people dead already, 562 last year, and the city does not seem to show a sense of urgency about this problem like they're dealing with COVID. Simply put, he wants more attention and awareness on the violence in our communities. We don't see the PSAs on TV. We don't see things remind everybody about how many people are dying on the streets every day. This is just not being treated with the urgency it deserves. He's known for a series of protests and marches, including a nearly month-long hunger strike in front of City Hall. And so he's back at it. We're marching from here to Governor Wolf's house in Mount Wolf, Pennsylvania, to ask him to help us out. Two weeks and 90 miles of marching from Philadelphia to Governor Wolf's home, where he hopes Governor Wolf will recognize the need for more funding and support than Mr. Johnson believes Philadelphia can provide alone. We have uh, just excessive carnage on our streets, and it needs to stop. And it's obvious that we cannot do it in the city of Philadelphia alone, that we need help. But we're going to ask Governor Wolf for that help. He announced the march surrounded by others who say they're also tired of a lack of support for our communities. And some know firsthand that as desperate as things seem, change is possible. I was shot nine times. I know what it's like. I've been in the game all my life. I changed my life because I feel like I was part of the destruction. And it's my humane duty 
because I'm conscious to make a change and to be a part of a change. So they march and they work. Yes, there's some anger at elected officials that they say can do more. But be clear, these individuals are holding themselves accountable as well. No, I'm not going to sit here and blame Mayor Kenny or all these politicians for what we're not doing. We are not doing our part. And I don't care what anybody else says. I'm telling you as myself, one individual, we are not doing enough. We don't patrol our streets. We don't stand up to our own politicians and make them accountable. And yet we want to sit around and think it's OK. It's not OK. I'm tired of it. This is a problem that is affecting us all across the Commonwealth. It's worth noting that just days after Mr. Johnson and others started marching, Governor Wolf came to Philadelphia to announce more funding to combat gun violence. But the march continues because to Mr. Johnson and others, action and change, it starts with ongoing accountability. I think what we need more of is we need people to start encouraging the community to get more involved so that they can make sure the people they elect get more involved and address this problem. Journalist Sergio Cool went back to some of the neighborhoods that he grew up in, spoke to some of the people who admit to having challenges, but now they're committed to making our communities better. I was about 14. Me and a couple of friends of mine, we had a singing group. Someone put a lot of marijuana in my hands and I started selling it, and then I caught my first case at 14 years old. I locked up. Ironically, my stepfather was a police officer. My mother uh, was um, addicted to drugs. She was a nurse for, you know, her whole life, but her undercover habit, she would splurge on the weekends. So that's basically where her money went, and that's what exposed me to the different life. I can remember as young as five, even maybe younger than that, being, you know, waking up in crack houses because she would go on her binge and, you know, I'm playing with the other kids. Her biological father was also addicted to drugs. Latasha lived a life of survival, but also a life of violent crimes. How many times have you been arrested, approximately? I've been arrested, i say, at least 18 times. But then when I got arrested in, I would say, 2008, um, it was for gun charges, um, shooting. And I always believe that whatever you do is, I don't judge anyone, as long as you can take the consequences for your actions, you know. So I'm not going to say, like, oh, jail is cool. It's not. It's nowhere you want to be at all. But I understood that if I did a crime, that's part of the game, and I had to, you know, take the consequences for it. My kids saw me in handcuffs one time, and that was, uh, that was, like, heartbreaking. 22-year-old Samaje grew up on the tough streets of Frankfurt, which caused him to have a few minor run-ins with police. He lost close to a dozen friends to gun violence. Samaje is a man of very few words, but he told me that the trauma never stops for him. A certain day come, like, we emotional, like, sure. we, we, we be like, I'm saying, we be mad, like, I get a FaceTime call from one of my, one of my bros, and they be hurting, snapping, crying, like, bro, for me, so it be like, yeah, it was like on like a holiday or like you feel me, his birthday or something. Like yeah, like and then it's like another birthday next month that another homie passed. So it's like it's just be back, back to back. Yeah, back. It's, so it's, like, it's an endless cycle. Word. Dr. Angel Richardson is a licensed professional counselor and also an assistant professor at Thomas Jefferson University. She understands the trauma that many affected by gun violence go through. The environment that we would grow up in it really shapes us. So. Whatever we are accustomed to growing up, that's what we normalize, right? And that can be good and bad. So sometimes if we grow up in an, an environment that may be violent or chaotic, we kind of normalize that. So we may come up with coping mechanisms, right? We figure out how to keep ourselves safe. The other challenge, though, may be maybe I normalize chaos. We can't ever think that because people are continuously exposed to it, that it stops impacting them or that it stops affecting them every time something new may happen. Latasha is off to a new beginning in 2022. She's in the process of opening up a music and photography studio for anyone who wants to get off the streets. She wants her story to be a resource and mentorship for the youth. Even if you feel like you want to get out the cold, if you want to learn something, if you want to learn how to make beats, if you just need to talk, anything, you can come, come to Gotti's house. 
Instead of retaliating for all the friends he lost, Samanjay turned to boxing and is now trying to help other young kids to put the gloves down and pick the gloves up. I had like 10 kids come in the gym just because they see me on Instagram and like, yo, I want box. Like, them boys be getting suspended from school or, and I'll have a talk and sit down and talk to them in real life be like, like trying to change their mindset. Latasha and Samaje experienced some tough times growing up in environments surrounded by gun violence. I, too, grew up in similar places. But, like myself, Latasha and Samaje were able to find an outlet to help the next generation and possibly save our streets. Something to think about. When we hear about people destroying our communities or participating in violence, many often claim that it wasn't them or they were innocent. And if you're being honest, you often dismiss those claims. But our Chris O'Connell spoke to a man who through arrest, trial, conviction, and incarceration always said that they got the wrong person. And in this case, he was right. <laughs> Writing has always been a part of me. Tapping away from his home office in Bluebell, writer Tremaine Hicks is working on dialogue for his latest play. Learning how to uh, create stories, to write the structure of plays. On his dining room, hundreds of pages of screenplays and theatrical scripts he's been writing for the past two decades. His credits include 12 plays, TV sketches, memoirs, and holiday plays. This is about a guy who's going home. But unlike most authors, all of Tremaine Main's work, every word of these scripts were written and produced behind the walls of a Pennsylvania state prison. I was able to produce my plays. So not only did I write plays, but I was actually hosting plays, putting plays on inside the penitentiary. This is one of Hicks' plays he produced with inmates inside the auditorium at the former Graterford Prison. But perhaps the most memorable production was all reality TV, nearly 20 years in the making. 19 years! Yeah! This was the snowy day in December 2020 when Hicks was released from state prison after being wrongfully convicted for the 2001 rape of a woman in South Philly. Fox 29 covered the story when Philadelphia police were called for the rape of a woman in an alley in what used to be St. Agnes Hospital. Hicks, on his way home with his brother, heard that woman screaming and ran to help. As he got to the victim, he says he reached in his pocket to call 911. Before before I took my hand out my pocket, I was shot three times in my back. Boom, boom, boom. I fell down. Wow. Hicks was shot three times by Philadelphia police officers who claimed he was the rapist. Months later, Hicks was eventually convicted and sentenced to up to 25 years in prison. Honing his writing talents behind bars, Hicks continued to claim his innocence, even giving up the possibility of an early release by eight years just by admitting responsibility. He says he'd never admit to a crime he didn't commit. The lies of the cops held true for a very long time until the Innocence Project came along with their own experts and said, you know, he's telling the truth and the cops is lying. The nonprofit devoted to exonerating the wrongfully convicted took on Hicks's case. And after nearly a decade of court battles and new forensic evidence, the district attorney's conviction integrity unit agreed with Hicks and his conviction was overturned. Hicks was released from state prison after 19 years. The picture of his release is the only thing that hangs on his living room walls. This is a, this is a thousand words right here, man. Um, so much going on man I couldn't believe that I was finally set free the same brother by his side the night he got arrested was there when he got released a bittersweet day for this whole family some he's still getting to know including his grandson he missed out on a lot he missed out on me growing up he missed out on his son growing up oh my my son my his niece and nephews so he missed out on a whole lot these days, Hicks is making up for that lost time. He's busy producing an anti-violence video campaign. His scripts are getting the attention of Netflix and Disney. And soon, this prison playwright will be going to Yale University for drama. And from there, 
Well, that script hasn't been written. What's the next picture going to be? Broadway, you know, Hollywood. I'm not certain, man. You know, the future is, is, is just big for me, man. It's, it's grandiose. It's, it's huge. It's a great day. So what's to come is going to be good things, man, as long as I'm still breathing. with a group of researchers who believe that the media, from newspapers to television, and how we report gun violence may actually be part of the problem. We sort of began to try to kind of unpack uh, some of these things and try to begin to understand what the best, the most ethical, the most empathetic, the most impactful reporting on gun violence might look like. You know, we created the center to explore the idea that changing the way that journalists and news organizations report on violence might actually prevent community gun violence, prevent shootings, and save lives. Dr. Jessica Beard, a trauma surgeon and researcher, and Jim McMillan, a longtime journalist, are two of the people looking deeply at how the media covers gun violence and if that coverage influences neighborhoods one way or the other. I initially went to the news to try to figure out why this was happening and really found uh, what you might call just sort of episodic reporting or reports about the episode, uh, you know, that would go something like this. 26-year-old man shot on the corner of Broad and Tioga. Police have no motives. There have been no arrests. Seems pretty standard and fact-based on the surface and the type of report that most of us have seen. But as their Philadelphia Center for Gun Violence Reporting dug deeper, their research indicates that the standard model of reporting it may actually lead to harmful responses. You know, it's it's complex why it's problematic. Um, number one is whose narrative is it, right? So it's the narrative of the police. It's the information that the police collect at a scene. It's not necessarily the narrative of a patient. When we ask patients, and we do ask them, what part of your story is important, a lot of them focus on the recovery from trauma, what it was like to be in the hospital, um, their resilience. You know, all of those things um, are, are very, very key and important parts the stories that that emphasize how human the person is that experiences this um, trauma and when they take their research a step further they found that simple what they call episodic reporting leads people to draw negative conclusions about victims and neighborhoods who did nothing wrong another issue is is that you know when you present people with episodes they tend to blame the victim right all they get is the information about the victim um, and they don't know about solutions they don't know who to hold accountable for these issues they don't know which solutions work they acknowledge that revising the way we cover gun violence is a complex situation that many may not have fully understood the effects the missing presumption of innocence that 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 if if there isn't an explanation that they were on their way to work or they held this sort of job or they were to start stuck within the house they must have been up to something the reporting can make people more fearful it can make more people more inclined to buy guns like the shooting victim you know, say reporting has scared their families when, when their conditions reported, that, um, that reporting the condition or location of where they were taken might actually put them in actual danger of continuing violence. And this is why they believe the discussion is so important and why they hope all of us working in and out of media will get involved. The work continues, and we will continue to work with them to do our part as we continue to ask you to do yours. What does the most ethical reporting look like? I think that that's where, you know, you and, and your colleagues are going to be really, really important. And as we go forward, we want to hear from you. So if you know of people who are doing positive things, have ideas, suggestions, or solutions, please let us know, and we'll feature them going forward. And on behalf of the entire Fox 29 family, thank you so much for watching.